everybody. Um, nice to see that like not everybody has gone to sleep already. Uh, <laughs> thank you for lasting the whole conference. I hope you're having a great conference. And I guess I'm kind of proud and feel the weight of responsibility of like being the last experience you'll have maybe of this conference. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, my name is Moshe Zadka. I'm going to talk to you about how I robots should do the nitpicks. Uh, my website is an obscure math joke that if you catch me later, I'll be happy to explain to you at length. Uh, so let's get started. Um, so what is the easiest and yet most useful code review that you can imagine? So I'm sure you've all seen that code review, possibly on your code, and possibly if you have had personal failings like me, you have given that code review. And that's going line by line and pointing out which part, you know, kind of like is not compatible with like a coding style or, or, or best practice. And here you should really like name that something else. And like little, little nitpicks, annoying. And it's really, really annoying to get them. It's not really useful to get them. Um, and it's kind of mechanical, right? Like you feel like a machine could have done better. Um, so why do people do that? So one reason why I've seen, and like I guess again, uh, confessing to personal failings, I've seen from the inside, uh, you don't like that PR for any reason, right? It might be an open source PR that you think is a bad feature. It might be an internal company thing, and like you really don't think that this is a good way to approach the problem. But you don't want to start like you know a big discussion around that. Maybe there's like some power lines there, and maybe there's like some issues. So instead, you're gonna be a speed bump. You're gonna make sure that like you comment on every line. Hopefully, by the time they finish, they'll be too tired and they won't argue with you and like. Like that whole feature can, can go away, and you won't have to deal with it, and you won't have to think. And sometimes, and this is like a point that Raymond Hettinger uh, made in his uh, Beyond Paper 8 talk, which is a great talk. Um, sometimes people do it to feel useful. You join a team. You don't really, you know, you might have Python experience from before, but you don't know any of the local tooling, the libraries what we're really doing, how we approach problems. But what I can do is I can go to the PR that someone submitted and point out all the things that can make it better. And this will make me feel useful, right? And people do that. People you know, want to feel useful as their job. They want to feel competent at their job. When you're starting out at a new company, whoever you are, you're not going to be competent on your first day. There's too much to absorb to take in. Um, so why are these not? A good idea is to do that, right? So you want to have some solidarity in the team, regardless of if it's an open source project or if it's uh, something inside the company. You want to feel like you trust people. They are all on the same team. They're all trying to achieve the same thing. Um, kind of having this adversarial relationship of uh, I'm going to kind of slow you down as much as I can is not good. And if someone is not feeling useful, you want them to uh, not be able to hide behind like the kind of paper curtain of like, you know, I'm doing something useful by reviewing every pull request and then eventually like, you know, rubber stamping it and everything looks hunky dory. No, you want them to admit that they need help adjusting, right? Maybe they need someone to mentor them. Maybe they need someone to sit with them for a couple of uh, pair programming session. And not giving people that safe space to hide makes you have to deal with it as your team, right? Maybe that's not the right position for the person. Maybe they need to move to a different team. But you, you should have this frank discussion instead of like, you'll eventually have the discussion, but instead of moving that discussion later and making everybody frustrated in the interim period. Um, so what do I mean when I say people nitpick? So I want to give like a short taxonomy, if you will. What kind of things are nitpicks? Um, so coding style. That's like the best known one. That's like the, the, the one that you probably think of, where you cite chapter and verse and you say, this doesn't comply with that coding style. Here's like a really, really nasty example that I kind of chose just for you. This violates PEP 8, section white space under, under recommendation, because it says that when the operators have different precedents, you should not have spaces around the star. This is really great, and it's great for a number of reasons. A lot of linters will not catch that, uh, because the linters has a simplistic rule of just always space around the operators. Um, 
most even internal in-house coding guide style says PEP 8 plus these other recommendations and maybe with these exceptions. They will probably forget this is an exception. So you really get to be correct, right? You really get to like find people out with like these obscure rules like in the middle of PEP 8 that no one has ever read. I can promise you that anyone who's ever talked about PEP 8 has not actually read it top to bottom. So you get like really kind of nasty, right? Because they can't even say that you're wrong. Our coding guide style is like PEP 8. This is Pepe. Um, so the other classic example is line lengths. That's like everybody's favorite thing, right? Because Pepe says 80 and Black says 88, and like you have a lot of popular linter configurations that have 100 and 120, and quite possibly my favorite, like the one from Eblint, which is uh, 80 sometimes unless it's like a special case where it will, will go out to 100, but no more. Uh, this is like the most, and this is like really useless, right? This is literally just counting, and you probably didn't even, can even count the characters yourself, right? You probably let the computers count, and all you're doing is like report, reporting the computer, right? Like in the Galaxy Quest, like I'm repeating the computer. This is literally you just repeating the computer. Um, the other classic uh, uh, nit is the consistency. We notice that something is done in two different ways across the code, and like none of them are really better, but you decided to kind of like uphold the consistency. Like, why is this not always the same thing, right? So, um, why are you passing amount and frequency to FROB and frequency and amount? To, like, why, why is this like order gen? And again, this is like literally mechanical, right? A, a thing could just like you know check that like you know like when the, the parameters are the same, they're always in the same order, right? This is not you using your useful human judgment, even though to like the untrained eye, it looks like you kind of are kind of actually contributing value. Or should you use uh, curly brace, open brace for an empty dictionary or dict, right? I've literally had that comment, like don't use dict, it's slower. This is not a performance critical code, it doesn't matter. Um, and, and honestly, you can paint the bike shed whatever color you want, right? You can paint it fluorescent green, it's still gonna hold your bicycle. Best practices are, my be are, are one of my favorites because there's so many to pick from, right? We're still, as a whole discipline, right? As a discipline, we're a young discipline. Software engineering is a young discipline. Inside of it, you know, kind of uh, um, high level code for web application is like an even younger practice. Like we maybe started like that seriously, like 99, right? It's barely 20 years. We haven't had time to settle on best practices, which means you always have like this new best practices that appearing or this old thing that used to be the new, the best practice before. And you can always kind of have these arguments of like, here you're like having too many functions. Here you should really be spreading that around. And there's like all these like things that you can always point out. You can always choose whatever best practice is popular in the latest blog and kind of point it out like the 10 places you, you, uh, you generate. And again, it, it usually doesn't give a lot of value. Um, but my absolute favorite is local practices because that's not only uh, 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 in general is annoying, you can really make the new people feel unwelcome that way, right? Because like nobody knows the local practices. Even if you have your local practice style guide on your wiki, probably like impossible to search for. Uh, probably you have not actually shown that to people. And also it's probably long and nobody has time to read it. And definitely no one can understand like 500 rules on the first day. So they're gonna miss one, right? So they're gonna miss the, the little one that you kind of, like in this company, we really don't like using print. Right, and there's, there's reasons for that, but it's definitely not the best practice. It's definitely not like um, in PEP8, but you know, like some companies like no no line of code to have print. That that's reasonable, but then having the 15 places you put print in your code, each one gets like eh, we don't use print. Hey, don't, that really makes you feel useful in your first PR, right? So um, this is annoying, right? So. Humans are inconsistent, right? Uh, um, you might have managed to point the 15 places that use print, but the other place was kind of hidden and like it was like a really, really long diff and like tons of green lines and you missed the print, right? You kind of managed to find the few places where the print was like the only line to change, but like the 100 line thing, you didn't find the print. So you pointed out like 10 of the places you found prints, but not the other one. So they fixed that and now you're still not just as bad as you were before. There's still points in your code, but uh, now you feel better about yourself or something. Um, 
humans get tired. Like it's really tiring. Like like as, as like as much as these are things are like to make yourself feel useful. Part of the reason that you, you feel useful is because it's so draining. It's really draining to have this kind of going line by line, remembering a hundred rules, right? Like computers are pretty good at it, but like humans are really, really suck at like applying rules. So it, it takes like a lot of cognitive resources, which means if you have a big PR with like five files, you're gonna get tired at the end of like file four. And you're not gonna point out all the things in like file five. And the ordering of the files is semi-arbitrary in what code review systems, like maybe it's kind of depend on like the order of check-ins or something like really, really arbitrary like that. So there's no thing that like makes something like, like so eventually you'll have this inconsistency throughout the code and like your entire kind of feeling useful is like gone at that point. Um, and then when people get these, uh, um, you know, like um, humans sometimes have emotions, they have feelings, they have like, you know, like, uh, uh, um, complicated uh, reasons for what they do, right? They're not really there to kind of make sure it's consistent. They're really there to delay it, right? And so they're going to comment on every line, finding something that's an issue. Uh, sometimes people just, you know, again, um, I'm not throwing shade at anyone else. I have definitely done this uh, probably more than any of you have. Why do you like to feel like you know stuff, like you like know better than other people? So I'm going to show you that even though you've been writing code for a while, I know the historic version of Pep8. So when you do that, no, this used to be in the old Pep8, but they recently changed it. And our local style guide actually, like, so you know, like, and, and the combination of these three laws means that you should not have an equal sign there, right? And you know, like. It's not useful for the team dynamic, right? And from the other side, the person who gets it code review, you know, they are upset, right? Like, you know, they probably worked hard on whatever code they worked. Um, you know, knowing people and like how development teams usually worked, they probably took more or less the entire time allocated for that task, so they're right at the deadline, and you know, quite possibly after. The deadline, right? If you know, <laughs> it's it's like uh, um, I do these things, um, and QA already needs that. And now, now after I'm like done, I'm like ready to move on to my next task. I probably have moved to my next task because it took you like five hours to do that. Um, now you tell me to go back and fix all of these things, which will also require me to rerun the unit test because like, I'm now moving all my print statements to logs. It is actually a code change that I can't automate, so I'm going to have to do it manually, and then I'm going to have to rewrite my, to change my unit test. The unit tests are going to fail. I have to fix them. I have to fix my code. And now the task has already kind of been delayed, and my manager is already kind of asking me when it's done. It's like getting pushed out further, and I'm getting upset, and I'm getting very frustrated. Um, and you know, there's like this annoyance of like, you know, I'm sure you have singled me out. And it doesn't matter if you actually single that person out or not, right? Uh, you might have done it you know, unconsciously, but even if you have not done it, right? Like, you know, people have this perception, and this is like, like you know, you can like look at the psychological research on that. People will definitely have the perception that you're always that, that you're just after them and you're annoying them more than you annoy other people, even if you yourself are like completely even unbiased observer, they will still feel like you're after them, right? And when you do like all these things, even if you do it to everybody. And they'll find a reason, right? Like, you know, maybe I'm new at the company, or maybe I'm old at the company, or whatever. Like, you know, that's why you're doing this to me. Um, so how do you solve it? We make the robots do it, right? We configure linters. And here I take the most expansive definition of linter, which is anything that looks at your code and tell you, tells you something is wrong with it without running it. And I'll even accept, like, if they just import the module and they don't really execute anything, it's kind of technically running in Python. Hopefully you're not doing any serious work on module import if you are just like stop, um, so it's okay. You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna like you know really nitpick the definition of linters here. Anything that kind of looks at your code and tries to give you feedback automatically, I consider a linter. So that works from all the way to like um, low-level things like black, which will just say that you know like your spacing is wrong here, or you know you have uh, a few extra. Uh, blank lines there, all the way to something like MyPy, which actually will point out like type inconsistencies. Here you're calling it with an int, you assumed you were getting a string, right? That's pretty complicated. They all fall under like my very expansive definition of linters. Um, 
And the idea is that you configure them, right? You tell them what to do. You run them as, you sh as, as they should. And the idea is when you've if you, until now you have not been using linters, or until now you have been using linters for only some things and humans for the rest, the first time you configure them, you want them to reflect the current consensus, right? Until now it was enforced informally by human beings. You want to shift the responsibility on enforcement to the robots. You do not want to have a discussion of what you enforce. What we enforce is what we have enforced until now. Even if you think it's a bad idea, even if the old intention is three spaces, this is what we have done so far. This is what we're going to enforce, right? Um, and this is really important because otherwise introducing the linters really annoys people. And if you enforce the current things that have been enforced anyway until now, just in an automated way, this will make people better off. This will make people happy. So you want that introduction of a linter to be a positive experience for the team. Um, so most linters come with a lot of uh, knobs. Ideally, most of those knobs are just enabling and disabling specific uh, warnings, right? Um, so, you know, if something has not been done until today, right, you have not enforced, you know, like spacing around, um, around operators, and uh, you're introducing a linter, then there's going to be a lot of places where <laughs> your operator spacing is not correct, right? There's no reason to introduce it just to have it fail immediately. So you can just say, ignore that. Like, you know, we're, we're, we don't even care about, like, you know, the, the operating system spacing. We're, we're doing something different here. That's fine. You know, that was a consensus until now. We can talk about shifting the consensus later. When you introduce a consensus, this is a consensus, right? Like, this is what we've been doing. It's clearly, like, you know, it's not the worst in the world. The company kind of functions. Um, then um, the things that the linter is not going to do, right? Because it's a local convention, because it's too weird. Um, if the linter doesn't do something, you can write a linter plugin, right? Almost all linters, PyLint and Flake 8, definitely like allows plugins. They're pretty distant plugin system. They work a little bit differently. I personally really like the Flake 8 plugin system because it just uses um, pip uh, entry points. So all you need to do is just to define a flake extension entry point, and you even get to, to choose the initial letter that the warnings will come under. And Eblint is one of my favorite flake 8 plugin because it makes flake 8 really, really, really strict. So you just, be, and, and the only interface you have to them is just keep installing them, right? So it's a clear interface in whatever you do uh, things, like in talks or requirements or TXT or wherever you document uh, test dependencies, you just pip install Eblint and that's it. You have Eblin configured from that point on. And if it's a local plugin you wrote and you put it in either on PyPI if you feel comfortable making it open source, <coughs> sorry, or um, if you put it on your internal repository, again, pip install, whatever it works. <coughs> um, okay, so if it doesn't fit into the mold of like a Lint, and sometimes it's annoying to get into Flake 8, especially if you want to, uh, say, have English style guide enforced inside comments. It's kind of annoying to do it with Flake 8. Eventually, it will let you have it the comments, but it's kind of hard, and you have to do it at the wrong level, and then get the comments and do some parsing. And it's all really, really annoying. Just write some ad hoc program to do that. In many, in many ways, this is kind of what Black did, right? It wasn't really a useful uh, Lint plugin because it thinks differently, so it's just a, a standalone program. Now, maybe not ad hoc because it's more serious, but eventually, that like, your little program might grow big too. That's fine. You know, you, should, you just start by like thinking, okay, how do I enforce this thing that until now we have enforced with human people, with robots, right? So, I have a project where I want every uh, file to start with a copyright header. This is like a small snippet from the little program that basically does OS walk, goes over, finds Python files. Um, it also does like a lot of nice things that are not enforced by almost any linter that I know. Like it looks for um, PYCs that don't have a, uh, a corresponding PY and will warn them because sometimes they're left over from some other thing and then you get like weird interactions. I, I had one interaction too many. So there's lots of things that like, you know, the, the architecture of linter is not set up, and that's fine. You know, don't use that architecture. You can write code for that. So this is like a small snippet from a real life. Uh, by the way, uh, the program that this is in is actually called Nitpicker. You call it with Python minus M and call me Nitpick. <laughs> um, 
So you have written the code. Right now, everything that the humans have enforced is equally well enforceable by robots. Now you want to make sure that it's in your CI system. This is as bad as failing tests, right? You want to make sure that this is treated as badly as failing tests by making sure that you disable merge, right? Again, like if you use any of the modern CI systems, there's probably a button that's called override and requires administrative because if like, you know, you're at 3 a.m. and you really want to push a fix out of production, you know, screw the lint. Um, but in general, again, it's just like writing tests, like you know, if you have an override button, have an override button, but you know, by default, you cannot merge into the main branch with lint errors, right? So, and this is nice because then no humans have to say that, right? As soon as you create a PR, as soon as you start working, you get all that feedback. You don't get that feedback uh, later on just before you're about to merge, especially if you're kind of smart and you create a PR early on in your development process as soon as you have a rough approximation for the call you do. Uh, you start getting those CI failures, you know, again, like however you get CI failures usually, either by mail or by notification or whatever system you have, you'll get those, you'll address those, you'll fix them. And usually fixing these things is pretty straightforward, right? You know, with black, you literally just run black, right? Um, something that's less straightforward, something you actually have to restructure your code, do whatever it takes to restructure them, and then push the CI again, push the PR again, wait for the CI to, fa to succeed. Um, now, the first time you do that, you'll discover that I haven't just been warning in theory about humans being inconsistent. Humans actually are inconsistent, right? So all the places you thought were just fine because a lot of people have scrutinized them are not fine because a lot of people scrutinize it. it was not as useful as you might imagine, and they actually have a lot of issues in them. Um, so the first time you start configuring it, Lint will fail. Um, some people address it by just, thank you, um, by, by making sure that uh, the Lint, uh, to have a big check-in that changes everything, that's usually really hard to kind of enforce if with PRs and stuff. Um, so often what you can do is just, you know, run the lint only on the files in the diff or files that have been, um, or, you know, if you have a lot of errors, you, you can have it just on files in the diff and then like, you know, you touch it, you buy it, right? You touch a file, you have to fix all the uh, historical lint errors. You can do it uh, slightly more, um, more subtly only on lines that were in the diff so you can't introduce new lint errors and uh, ideally you'll fix the uh, old ones as things are reasonable and as the code mutates. Um, so, you know, it depends a little bit on how bad things are, obviously. Um, you can support it with explicit whitelists, which is like uh, one of my favorite ways. You just have a long whitelist of like files that are not supposed to pass the linter. You do not add new files to that and you try to remove files Again, like, you know, when you, the first time you kind of touch a file in a big way, you, you uh, take it out of the whitelist and you can easily kind of, when you look at a PR and you see a file being touched and you see it's in the whitelist, you're like, hey, maybe let's also fix that while you're at it. Um, and then you live by a simple rule. That if, if the CI doesn't care, you're not allowed to nitpick, right? If the CI path, if the like, little thingy is green, then you're not allowed to point anything else. Uh, that's the Beyonce rule, which is if you cared about it, you should have put a lint on it. Um, so to summarize, um, humans are going to be human unless you're like really into genetic engineering or cyber technology, in which case I really want to talk to you uh, after this. Uh, humans are going to stay human. You can't make humans be different, um, but you can use that, right? Humans are not good at being consistent, they're not good at being meticulous and so on, but they are good at giving you deep insights, right? If you stop them from having the ability to having like nitpick insights on your PR, when they review your code, they'll have to come up with genuine insights based on what they know about, you know, the system, the logic, like, this seems like a bad place to put a quadratic algorithm because it's going to break all our users. It's like the kind of deep insights you want from humans versus uh, you forgot a space here, which is not a deep insight uh, that you do not want from humans and you're better off if robots give it to you. Um, so that's it. Uh, go forth, uh, link all the things, and thank you very much. And I think I have some time for questions. Yes, we have time for questions for five minutes. Okay. Does anybody have a question? Yeah. Um, um, you talked about uh, some of the errors that come up. 
You talked about some of the errors that come up uh, as English grammar mistake or spelling mistakes. Do you, would you, do you know any tools that can help uh, uh, link that? So you literally can uh, filter out the comments and run something like I spell or like like the native uh, spell checker and like I'm sure that there's like, like modern spell checkers that are even better, but you can literally run any of those on your code and again like you know just um, write an ad hoc something that like you know kind of exits uh, uh, with failure and then put it in your talks or whatever you configure your CI. Yes. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, in CI, this all makes sense and is good, but we have developers who would like to do their linting before they push sure. and start like a big Docker build in CI and all that. But they have different OSs or at least different code editors. And so if I start writing custom scripts, then I need like them to have custom dependencies on their development environment. Tell me your thoughts. So there's, there's pretty great tools that help with that. Um, I guess my, my kind of current favorite is Tox. Though I'm kind of thinking of switching to Nox. But, but Tox is good enough, right? Like if you're using Tox. Um, so Tox is a good way to kind of wrap up all your dependencies. Make sure you know what you're running and what are the dependencies of that in a file that can run anywhere. And then your, ideally your CI configuration will not be more complicated than run these Tox environments. And you know which Tox environments you run. And you know, it, it might still be annoying with different OSs. Um, I would also recommend as someone who kind of like has some experience with like um, developer velocity, like harmonize your developers. Like editors are really hard, but at least like OSs, maybe get them on only one or two OSs so you can support your talks, at least those two, uh, and ideally even one. Um, so yes, like you want to harmonize the things, and you definitely do not want to trust something like PyCharm or auto running lint. That's never going to work because there'll always be one person, probably going to be me, who insists on using VI. So you want to encode it in something like Tox, and you like, you know, if PyCharm makes you faster because it, you know, it makes Tox find better lint errors, go ahead and use it. But for us, the objective criteria is Tox, and if Tox locally is uh, different than Tox in the CI, that's a bug. Like we treat it as, as a full scale bug and we will fix it, right? Like we'll do whatever it takes, right? I, I don't know why that happened, right? But you know, we'll do better equal equal, we'll do better version pinning. By the way, like I highly recommend um, if you're using PyLint in your talks that run the PyLint, pin PyLint, PyLint each version comes up with new warnings. You really don't like that. That's a good way to fail the build on CI and not fail it locally. So you don't want it to happen. So pin the PyLint. If there's one thing I've I managed to uh, get across always pin your pilot. Is, 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 I, I felt like I've done my job uh, giving this talk. Well, again, like I have talks. I usually use talks for that, but you can you know, use other things that are like talks, right? You know, if you enjoy using make files, you know, use make files. I'm not judging here. Or Nox. I, I kind of like want to start seeing if I want to switch to Nox. OK, any other questions? I think we have time for one more, maybe? Thank you. That was a really good talk. Um, anything that you know about that could be used for SQL linting or any of these like the little DSLs that are somehow embedded in our code as strings that we want to have yeah. style checking and so that we want to be able to I, make nitpick on? Yeah. So I, I don't know a lot about SQL linting, but I can give some ideas. Um, so first of all, um, it should be reasonably easy to kind of uh, have enough heuristics in, in, in like uh, something that calls the AWS and the AST and, and, and spits out the SQL stuff. Um, there's a lot of uh, um, a lot of Python parsing libraries can parse SQL. There's like a bunch of those. Um, I, I, had, I had a friend who literally like uh, implemented it in, in like two hours. Uh, you know, again, like if it parses most of SQL you use, it's good enough. And then, you know, you can use that parse tree to kind of like construct whatever lint tools you have. So I don't know of anything that does it, but it shouldn't be too hard to kind of improvise around it. Okay. Um, do you use the linting only to flag issues that use uh, that require human interaction to kind of fix them or do you also recommend some kind of like automatic formatter to enforce it so so you know like like black clearly showed that automatic formatter is are great right but i i the black on the ci should never automatically fix it the black on the ci 
side of things should just you know like flag issues, right? Then it's really nice to be able to like whenever bl black flags an issue, run it locally, we check in, right? Then it's really easy. If you have anything that like automatically fixes things, definitely bundle it in like you know whatever tool chain you have, so that when developers see any of these issues, right, they can just like you know uh, run the fix script that will locally do it. But you do want to, to make like every line of code, regardless of its space chain, should come from a specific developer, right? I don't like it when CI changes code. So the CI should always flag things, and then if you have a fixed script that maybe calls black and maybe calls a bunch of other things that, that can automatically fix, that's fine. You know, because then the programmer ran it, he can, you know, or she can look at this thing and see that it's okay. And any other questions? Um, I think we're all done, so okay. thank you all again. Please give Moshe a round, warm round of applause. Thank you, Moshe.